In this episode of Body Story, two different life forms find themselves at home in the human body. They enter by very different means, but their aim is the same, to take advantage of the conditions they find inside. Marion Swift's invader is welcome, but she may still reject it. The growing fetus has to control her body if it's to survive. Month by month, it triggers incredible changes in Marion's body, preparing for the day it will face the outside world on its own. Then, fate brings Holly Jones together with a common but potentially deadly adversary, the flu virus. The virus makes its home in her throat. It multiplies and spreads like wildfire. We see how Holly's symptoms are caused by her own body as it fights the virus. Swift doesn't know she's pregnant. Come on in. But in just six days, her fertilized egg has become a ball of around 100 cells. It has traveled along one of her fallopian tubes and is now free floating down the wall of her womb. Contained within this tiny ball of cells is everything it takes to make a perfect human being. But its journey is fraught with danger. The first three months are critical. That's when three quarters of all miscarriages occur. If the embryo is to survive, it must seize control of Marion's body and transform it taking sustenance and shelter, and even raiding it for food. So put the kettle on then. What happened? I just lost my footing. <laughs> First, the embryo has to find a foothold. It releases enzymes which melt away the lining of Marion's womb. Each of the cells which make up the embryo is an alien invader containing not just Marion's genes, but those of her husband, Ian. Marion's body is patrolled by immune cells which seek out alien organisms. These macrophages destroy invaders by eating them. In her womb, the macrophages surround the newly arrived embryo. But on the surface, the embryo looks just like a normal part of Marion's body. Taken in by this disguise, the macrophages move on. But the embryo is still not safe. In a week's time, Marion will begin to menstruate, and the tiny embryo will be flushed from her body. Its only hope is to stop Marion's period. It burrows deep into the womb wall in search of her blood vessels. Inside the wall, it pumps out a hormone known as HCG. The hormone seeps into Marion's bloodstream and proceeds to hijack her menstrual cycle.
Marion's period is normally triggered when her body stops making the sex hormones progesterone and estrogen. But HCG tells her body to carry on making these hormones. Her period, which should have started a week ago, has been put on hold. Though the embryo is no bigger than a grain of rice, it has already taken control of the systems which regulate Marion's body. HCG is the embryo's signature. It's what the pregnancy kit detects in Marion's urine. And it's a sign that the embryo has well and truly arrived. Man. From now on, Marion's well-being comes second to the growing demands of the new life inside her. The embryo continues to pump out HCG. Unfortunately, and no one knows exactly why, one of the side effects of the hormone is a feeling of nausea, especially in the early morning. It may not be much consolation to Marion, but her sickness is a sign of her embryo's health. It is six weeks since sperm met egg. What was a ball of 100 cells now has a beating heart and is growing legs and arms. Yet it is only the size of a kidney bean. The outermost cells of the ball have become the placenta, connecting the embryo to Marion's bloodstream. Some placental cells even break free into her blood. Over the next nine months, 25 million of them will enter her body. Why they do this is a mystery, but it may be another way of forcing Marion to accept her new guest. Now the embryo begins to prepare Marion's body for the task ahead. Okay. Ah, oh, sick as a dog. Oh, look at me, I look like a pawn queen. Her breasts are getting bigger and more oh, tender. No. Oh, look. Even though she won't be breastfeeding for another eight months, they're starting to grow the complex structures which produce milk. Are you sure you're up to shopping? I'll be fine. <laughs> but before that, the embryo has a lot of growing to do, and growth requires energy. How about this for the nursery? Oh, no, that's an awful colour. It was only a thought. I just think it's tempting fate to paint the nursery this early. Anyway, I prefer yellow. For the first time, the placenta starts to produce its own supplies of progesterone and estrogen. These new hormones flood into every part of Marion's body. In her brain, Levels of progesterone rise to seven times normal, interfering with the electrical signals pulsing between her brain cells. The progesterone acts like a tranquilizer. Marion feels exhausted, which is just what the embryo wants. It needs her to conserve energy so it can put more and more demands on her body. At nine weeks, as the embryo takes on human form, it is now called a fetus. Although still the size of a grape, it continues to prepare Marion for the day it will be much bigger and need vast quantities of blood to feed it. You missed a bit. Over the next few months, Marion's body must produce an extra three and a half pints of blood. To achieve this, the fetus sets off a chain reaction.
Its hormones in her bloodstream make the muscular walls of her blood vessels relax and expand. Marianne's blood pressure starts to drop. The fetus is taking advantage of the body's ability to regulate itself. The drop in blood pressure makes Marion feel thirsty. The extra fluid she drinks is retained in her bloodstream. Her blood pressure returns to normal, but her blood is now more dilute than it was. The factories that produce red blood cells go into overdrive until her blood returns to a healthy concentration. In order to pump this extra blood around her body, Marion's heart will have to beat faster. And as its muscle works harder, her heart will actually increase in bulk and size. Hi there, Sparky. Oh, look, he's got his hands above his head. At the command of this tiny fetus, Marion's body has undergone an incredible internal transformation. Although she doesn't look that different, her heart is pumping an extra 70,000 pints of blood a day. It's very active, isn't it? The temperature all over her body has risen, in places like her hands, by several degrees. For Marion, the worst part of her pregnancy is over. More important, her body is now fully equipped to feed the fetus as it grows to 100 times this size. Three months into her pregnancy, Marion feels fantastically healthy. Pregnancy has become a pleasure. But even her sense of well-being is controlled by her fetus. Over the nine months of pregnancy, it will produce more estrogen than a non-pregnant woman can make in an entire lifetime. Flooded with estrogen, Marion's brain becomes more sensitive to the mood-enhancing brain chemical, serotonin. She actually feels happier. She doesn't just feel better, she looks better too. Increased blood flow to her lips make them redder than normal. Each hair grows thicker and faster, giving it a natural shine. This change may have a purpose, making Marion more attractive to Ian, encouraging him to stay to the bitter end. Marion is about to change again, visibly this time. Till now, her womb, normally the size of a tangerine, has easily accommodated her fetus. But in the next three months, the fetus will grow to around 60 times its present size and her womb must expand too. But her womb can't grow new cells. So each individual cell must stretch until it's eight times its normal length. Marion's other organs have to make room for her expanding womb. First, her intestines are pushed aside, then her stomach and her liver. Even her heart, already dealing with an increased workload, is twisted onto its side. At six months, Marion's torso is packed full. lungs, also squeezed by her enlarged womb, are having to work harder too. Like any living creature, the fetus needs to get rid of waste products. It uses Marion's bloodstream as its dumping ground. 
This waste includes carbon dioxide, toxic in high doses. To get rid of it, Marion must inhale and exhale 20% more air. She isn't just eating for two, she's also breathing for two. As well as pressing up on her lungs, Marion's womb is pressing down on her bladder, so she frequently feels that her bladder is full. With just two months to go, the fetus is still less than half its birth weight. It needs to put on a half pound each week until it is born. The source from which it feeds is Marion's body. The fetus needs calcium to harden its bones. Marion is eating plenty, but it's still not enough for her fetus. So it turns to her long-term calcium stores her skeleton. Deep inside her bones are cells called osteoclasts, which are capable of dissolving bone away. Now these cells go into overdrive, releasing calcium into her bloodstream to be carried to the fetus. Marion feels no ill effects, but her bones are slightly weaker than normal. Ian, when do you think we'll get the nursery finished? Well, not now, darling. Not at three o'clock in the morning. Sorry. As well as calcium from her bones, the fetus is helping itself to proteins from Marion's blood. Without these proteins, liquid flows out through her blood vessel walls into the spaces around her cells, making them swell with fluid especially at the wrists and ankles. In her wrists, the swelling squeezes nerves, making her hands and fingers a little numb. Oh. Oh. Sorry. <sighs> Where are you going? Uh, wait now, I might as well go and do the nursery. Don't be silly. Come back to bed. <laughs> At eight and a half months, the fetus has grown to the size of a football. It's toning its muscles with the occasional practice kick. What are you doing down there, Sparky? Marion is having a Braxton Hicks contraction. These mild, irregular contractions are a workout for her womb to keep it toned and fit for the exertions ahead. Each muscle cell that makes up her womb is in training in an attempt to make labor as easy as possible. For nine months, Marion's body has provided food and lodging for her fetus. Now it's about to make one final demand on her body. The fetus triggers its own birth, so no one knows exactly what makes it choose its moment. One theory is that it's simply hungry, having grown so large that Marion's body can no longer satisfy its appetite. Good. In its ultimate act of control over Marion, the fetus sends out a chemical signal. The hormone oxytocin is released from both Marion's brain and the fetus's brain into her bloodstream. 
It binds to her womb muscle cells and makes them contract violently. Okay. Yeah. I think I'll just go and lie down for a bit. Yeah. What? Each time Marion has a contraction, it pulls the neck of her womb, her cervix, open a little further. Labor is a self-perpetuating cycle. Each contraction triggers more oxytocin to be released from Marion's brain. And more oxytocin triggers more forceful contractions. Once labor starts, it cannot stop. It can only get more intense. Right, keep breathing now. Hold it and push down. That's the girl. Keep it coming. Up. Right, so deep breath in quickly. Hold it and push. And push. Yes. And again. It has taken 12 hours for Marion's cervix to dilate or open fully. Now she can push the baby's head into the birth canal. Yes, yes. Good girl. Another deep breath in, hold it, and push. Yes, come on. Deep breath in, hold it, and push down. Push down. Push down. Uh, don't bend my legs so much. I feel like a frog. <laughs> the pain of giving birth is the result of an evolutionary trade-off. Because humans have the largest brains, our babies have large heads. Give me that extra. Give me that extra. Another quick one. Yet to walk upright, we need a rigid pelvis. Beautiful. Oh. The combination of an inflexible pelvis and a large head makes birth more agonizing for humans than any other species. Ah! Ah! I can't. Oh. And again. And again. How traumatizing birth is for the baby, we can never know. But both Marion's brain and the fetus's brain release massive doses of natural painkillers called endorphins. Without them, it's possible that childbirth might be even more painful. He's still going. Push. baby breathes with its own lungs, it is no longer dependent on Marion's body for survival. One relationship is over, but a new one is about to begin. Up next, spawning of a different kind inside the human body. This one not nearly so nice, nor welcome. How the nasty flu co-opts cells to do its viral bidding and breeding 
and the biological warfare we wage against the invader. Holly Jones is a healthy young woman. Hi, Mayfield Stanley. Sixth floor. Thank you. But her body is about to become a battlefield. Can you hold the doors, please? Hold on. A sneeze explodes into the area at 40 miles an hour, sweeping 100,000 droplets of mucus into every corner of the elevator. Excuse me. Bless you. Most of these droplets are harmless, but some carry living organisms which are highly infectious. These bacteria and tiny viruses will spawn inside a human body. The cold, dry air of the elevator will kill them in minutes. They urgently need to find another human host. I'm a singer. Are you hoping to give up your day job then? Yeah, the uniform's too hot. The invaders have found refuge in Holly's nose, but they're not safe yet. First, they must get through the forest of hairs which lines her nostril. These hairs are her first line of defense. They trap nearly every particle she breathes in. The invaders are swamped by a wave of mucus. For the bacteria, this is as far as they will get. An enzyme in the mucus dissolves them away. But just one spiky virus survives. As Holly breathes in again, she rips the virus from her nose hair and sucks it into the cavern of her nostril. This is one of the more common viruses, called influenza B. It's on a mission to multiply. And to do so, it has to hijack a particular kind of human cell found in the lining of Holly's throat. The virus is now at the top of Holly's nostril. If it can reach her throat, it has the power to cause her total misery. Winding nasal passages are designed to trap invaders and wash them into her stomach to be destroyed. But Holly's own breath pulls the virus free yet again, closer and closer to her throat. That's from me to you. You gotta take it in your stride. You can't hide. You can't hide. You can't hide. You can't hide. Against all odds, the virus has made it to Holly's throat. As it burrows through a thick sea of mucus, it approaches the cells which are its target. Now it has to pull off one final trick. The flu virus has evolved to take advantage of the way that human cells work. Holly's cells communicate with each other using proteins as messengers. Hello, Korea. The spikes on the virus allow it to impersonate one of these proteins. It docks with receptors on the surface of Holly's cell. The cell is fooled. It reads the virus as a harmless protein. The virus slips inside. 
the first stage of the invasion is complete. It's seven hours since Holly first breathed in the virus. She still feels fine, but deep inside her throat cell, the virus is already wreaking havoc. It has seized control of the cell's machinery. Instead of making proteins, the cell is manufacturing components for thousands of new viruses. Holly's cell has become a virus cloning factory. From this single throat cell, 10,000 viruses are born. Each new virus will set out to hijack another cell and turn it into a new cloning machine. Phase two of the invasion is on the way. Journalist might come down and give us a review. Oh, really? Yeah. Right, I'm just going to run through what we're going to do on Friday. Obviously, set drums up at the back. Yeah. We're going to have two sets of four hours. In just two hours, the virus has infected 5,000 cells in Holly's throat. Then, Dave, you're going to be stage left, so get all your gear around here. So, your stuff's going to be here. Set all of your gear up there. If it spreads to her lungs, it could make her critically ill. Really, but I would imagine one, two. It's time for her body to fight back. The frontline troops of the immune system are the natural killer cells. They patrol Holly's body looking for trouble. They spray a poison to destroy the pieces of virus being hatched inside the cell. But this is warfare of the crudest kind. In the process, many of Holly's own throat cells are obliterated. Keyboards at right angles, so that's okay. no problem. Excuse just a second, love. Thanks. Um, but the whole, you're going to have the full run of the whole stage. Now, we've got four I'm sorry to the band, Mrs. Alex. Might get another coffee. Anyone want one? Oh, yeah, please, Monica. Cappuccino, no sugar? Yeah. How long have you been going out with her? The crude methods of the natural killer cells aren't enough to contain the virus. It's now breeding inside half a million of Holly's throat cells. Somewhere in her body, she does possess the ultimate weapon against influenza B, two single immune cells capable of wiping out the invasion altogether. But they are two cells among trillions. And until they're found, Holly's natural killer cells must soldier on alone. The collateral damage gets worse. Cell debris piles up in her throat. If it isn't disposed of, she could choke as she sleeps. But Holly's immune system has its own cleanup crew. These macrophages dispose of cell debris in a simple way. They eat it. Debris that isn't devoured by macrophages is carried away on tiny beating hairs called cilia to be swallowed and digested. For the first time, Holly can feel the effects of the battle being waged beneath her skin. Trying to contain the virus, her own immune system has destroyed thousands of throat cells. Holly's throat has become raw and swollen and sore.
Holly is getting the flu, but her symptoms won't be caused by the flu virus directly. Instead, they'll be triggered by the desperate rear guard action of her own body. I'm sorry, I've just got a bit of a sore throat. Great timing. Leave it, Alex. OK, Hull. Yeah, it's nothing. I'll be fine. Let's just go from the top, OK? The next phase in Holly's immune response has begun. Now her whole body will be recruited into the battle against the virus, and her well-being will be sacrificed until the war is won. The macrophages working in her throat release chemical smoke signals called interleukins. Interleukins surge through her bloodstream, summoning reinforcements to the battlefield. The interleukins also make Holly feel terrible. They make her nerves hypersensitive, so the slightest movement causes her pain. The virus has only attacked a tiny patch of cells in her throat, yet her body aches all over. Just go and get some rest. You'll be fine. But her pain has a purpose. Holly's body is telling her to slow down. She'll need every ounce of energy to defeat the virus. See you later. Amy. Well, you don't have to stay in just because of me, Rach. Actually, I'm not. I'm going out in a minute. Look, are you all right? Do you need anything? I'm freezing. You just don't care. See you later. The interleukins have opened up a new front against the virus. Holly's brain contains a natural thermostat, which keeps her body temperature at a steady 98.6 degrees. Unfortunately, this temperature provides a perfect breeding ground for influenza B. So the interleukins turn her thermostat up. This tricks her body into thinking it's cold. She shivers to heat herself up. Holly is getting a fever. As her temperature rises, virus cloning slows down. But other processes in her body speed up. New immune cells are produced at a faster rate. Even her hair and nails grow 20% quicker than normal. Holly's raised temperature makes the blood vessels around her brain swell. The pressure gives her a throbbing headache. Though very high fevers can be dangerous, it's not bad that she can't find any pills for her headache. Painkillers would also lower her fever and give the virus a new lease on life. Holly feels dreadful, but her immune system will make her suffer for as long as it takes to defeat the virus. Hello? Oh, hi, Dave. Yeah. Yeah, much better. No, really, I'll be fine. 
News from the front isn't good. More and more killer cells have arrived in her throat, but millions of new viruses are still being spawned. Okay, well, come and check on me in the morning. All right, I'll see you then. Yeah, bye. Holly's chances of singing on stage in 24 hours are looking remote. Her body is losing the war. Holly has been fighting the virus for 36 hours with no sign of success. But somewhere in her body, there exists a weapon so powerful, it could destroy the virus completely. The task is to find it. All over her infected throat, cells called dendritic cells have been gathering fragments of virus. Wearing virus spikes like badges on their surface, they go in search of the ultimate weapon against influenza B. You're not eating anything. So you clean the bathroom. That's all right, I get on my way out. See you later. Hope you're feeling better. Bye. All of Holly's hopes are pinned on the dendritic cells. The immune system is one of the most remarkable features of the human body. Here in Holly's lymph, a trillion cells known as T cells and B cells are floating, each one individually designed to kill a different foreign invader, each one waiting for the call. And among these trillion cells, just one T cell and B cell are designed to deal with influenza B. If they're found, they'll mount a devastating pincer attack on the virus. You all right, Hal? Hi. How are you feeling, Hal? Terrible. Look, I'm sorry, but we're going to have to cancel. A dendritic cell reaches one of Holly's lymph glands. It offers up its virus spikes, seeking out the one cell which might recognize the virus. Finally, it docks with a T cell. For 25 years, this one T cell has been waiting to be called into action. It begins to divide. Within hours, the original cell will become thousands of T cell clones. You don't look good. No. Sorry. What if I'm ill that the minute I'm not around, you let Alex kick me out? So who's this Monica then? She's Alex's girlfriend. He wanted her in the band from the beginning. Can she sing? She knows the songs. She hasn't got the stinking flu. I'll be on stage now. Packed with dividing T cells, Holly's glands have begun to swell. But this time, her pain is a sign that the tide is turning. The T cells are launched into her bloodstream. In Holly's throat, the T cells arrive in the thousands. They home in on infected cells and take them out with surgical precision. The final battle has begun. <coughs> Holly's cough is further evidence that the T cells are winning. 
the cilia, which carry away cell debris, have themselves been damaged in the battle. Now the only way Holly can clear this debris from her throat is by coughing. Meanwhile, the other half of the pincer attack has begun. In Holly's lymph, a B cell has recognized a virus spike and begun to clone itself. Unlike T cells, B cells don't go to the battlefield. Instead, they manufacture millions of minute proteins called antibodies. Like tiny heat-seeking missiles, the antibodies target newborn viruses, locking onto their spikes. Smothered in antibodies, the viruses are paralyzed. They can no longer infect Holly's cells. The invader has no place to hide. The viruses breeding inside cells are killed by T cells. Free-floating viruses are neutralized by antibodies. Between them, they will wipe the virus out. But Holly's symptoms won't disappear just yet. Only when her immune system scales down its effort will she start to feel better. It has taken a week for Holly's body to beat the virus. On the battlefield, new throat cells are starting to grow. Most of the T cells, their job done, shrivel and die. But some, known as memory cells, will patrol her body forever. The memory cells make Holly immune. If the virus tries to invade again, they'll instantly wipe it out. But influenza B has one more trick to play. It can mutate so that the next time Holly's memory cells might not recognize it. And she'll get ill all over again. Well, she wasn't that bad. Alex, they were throwing beer cans at her. Yeah, one of them hit me. No, oh, never mind, eh? Yeah, well, thanks, well, mate. So you reckon you'll be a lot safer with me back in the van? <laughs> Just a bit. <laughs> Though Holly no longer has flu, the last few viruses remain in her saliva. Her virus can't survive outside a human host. It urgently needs a new body to colonize. 